for the beauty of the earth. And this is my father's world. And I sing the mighty power of God, played by Barbara Reed this morning. Thank you, Barbara. And if you look at those lyrics, you'll see pieces of creation written into them. And that is my theme this morning, looking at creation, the world around us. Growing up, we lived in a, um, this, um, this is my family, not when I was little. Um, we lived in a, a small development. Um, but my, and my kids always loved being outside. They loved to be outdoors. In fact, you know, if we could have lived at camp or a place where there were woods and lots of trees and rocks to climb and places to explore, that would have been a preference. But even in our little development, they found a nature, creation, things to do. Several years ago, on a Sunday afternoon, I was waking up from a nap. They came running into the house to tell me there was an owl in our tree. This little guy was perched maybe 10 feet or so up in our pine. And they just sat there and watched it. We love uh, going camping as a family. And, and as I said, just being outdoors. We relate, we all relate, all of us relate to the beauty of our created world in some way or another. Some prefer the beauty and the smell of a flower over the crawling or hopping creatures um, that we find around. But we all relate to what God, uh, what God has made, created in some way. Creation is the act of creating, especially the act of bringing the world into order and existence. So we recognize and celebrate that fact that God in his infinite wisdom mapped out and placed into being the world and all who live in it. Another definition for world, um, the world and all who lived in it, um, is that system of created things, the universe. Some of my thoughts, um, some of my thoughts that helped me this morning come from a commentary on Psalms by Cameron Howard. Psalm 104 is a hymn of praise to God as creator. It is remarkably complete in its review of earth and space, flora and fauna, topography and geology. Psalm 104 has 36 verses, but I'm only going to read the first nine for us this morning and, and then reference some as I go along. Let all that I am praise the Lord. O oh Lord, my God, how great are you. You are robed with honor and majesty. You are dressed and robed in light. You stretch out the starry curtains of heavens. You lay out the rafters of your home in the rain clouds. You, uh, you make the clouds your chariot. You ride upon the wing, wings of the wind. The winds are your messengers. Flames of fire are your servants. You place the world on its foundation so it would never be moved. You close the earth with floods of water, water that covered even the mountains. At your command, the water fled. And at the sound of your thunder, it hurried away. Mountains rose and valleys sank to the levels you decreed. Then you set a firm boundary for the seas so that they would never again cover the earth. 
That was actually from the New Living Translation. Well, the psalmist's list of these diverse aspects of creation praises God's greatness with particular attention to God's control of and power over the creation. The psalmist here paints a picture of the landscape using vibrant imagery and powerful images. Psalm 104 recalls the taming of chaos and the vast scope of the first account of creation in Genesis 1, which says the earth was formless and empty and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Psalm 104 emphasizes order, limits, and separation. The waters stay within their boundaries. In verse 9, and the sun and moon mark proper times and seasons. Likewise, Genesis 1 recounts God's separation of light from darkness. Waters above from waters below and the waters of earth from the dry land. Just as the Psalms list a elements of creation seems comprehensive, so too does the Psalm imagine it, the imagination, a series of characteristics of the creator God. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but have you ever wondered um, about standing beside God and talking and conversing? That's the image I kind of feel out of some of these verses in 24, 25, and 26, which read, How many are your works, Lord? Starting the conversation. In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan with the you which you form to frolic there. Together, God and the psalmist survey the vastness of the sea, and the tiny ship perched atop it. And at the psalmist's prodding, they reflect on the dependency on God shared by all creatures under and above the water. It may be hard for us to imagine a scene like this, God standing with the human poet, looking out over the sea together as the poet expresses his praise for God in his creative hand. The psalmist uses the image of the human body, God in human form, to describe his power over creation. God has an open hand in verse 28, or a hidden face in verse 29. God can look on the earth and touch the mountains, verse 32. These images recall the similar characteristics featured the features of God in the second account of creation in Genesis 2-3. In that story, God shapes dirt into the first human. God breathes into the human to give him life. And God takes walks through the garden. In Psalm 104, verse 30, we read that when God sends his spirit, They are created, and you renewed the face of the earth. In verse 25, we're reminded that when when the creatures of the earth, including us humans, take their last breath, we return to dust. But in verse 30, through his spirit, creation is renewed. There is continual movement of God's spirit at work in the world. I don't know if God continues to create new species or not, but sometimes I wonder at that possibility. I do know that we continue to find new new creatures in our world. And if you 
Google or search top 10 um, species, creatures living or found during a certain year, you, they have a top 10 list. And from last year, I'm going to just share six of the top 10, partly because I can't fit them all in and I can't um, necessarily say their names right. But number one is a spectacular new fish, which they named Rose. It's a colorful reef fish from the Maldives. Um, it's the first new to science species discovered by Maldi Maldivian scientists. That's just, just briefly of, of each of these. Number two is a tiny owl found on a small island in Africa. With the help of the locals on Principe, a small island in Africa's Gulf of Guinea, scientists found Otis Bicigilia, Gila, that's the, the, the scientific name, a new species of scop owls. Number three, an anemone, an anemone that lives on the back of a hermit crab. An anemone is a sea, um, uh, flowers, but as a sea anemone is, they are named after and resemble flowers, yeah. But they're actually invertebrates related to coral and jellies. Their bodies consist of soft cylinder, cylindric, cylinder like stock topped by an oral disc surrounded with venomous tentacles. Sounds dangerous. Well, it's a newly described um, species that has been found off the coast of Japan and appears to live exclusively on the shells of hermit crabs. Four is a tree, actually, named after a slain indigenous activist. A new tree species found in the rainforest of Nicaragua and Honduras was named, Car um, well, I can't name it and say it rightly, but um, it was named after Berta Isabel Calceres Flores, who was an indigenous activist from Honduras, who was killed in 2016 for her opposition to a major dam project. And then number five is an Ind Indonesian's charming new sunbirds. A group of researchers in the tropical um, Wakatobi Islands in central Indonesia found several new species of sunbirds. And then I threw this one in. Um, it was number eight on the list. But it's a frog that looks like it's made of chocolate. It is from the Peruvian Amazon. Well, we are in a season of creation right now. It's a time when the world's Christians, Christians are invited to pray, reflect, and commit to caring for creation. The season uh, begins September 1st and ends on October 4th, which is the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, who is the patron saint of ecology because of his support of animals and, and, and the environment. This time of creation offers, in the words of Pope Francis, individual believers and communities a fitting opportunity to reaffirm their personal vocation to be stewards of creation, to thank God for the wonderful handiwork which he has entrusted to our care, and to implore his help for the protection of creation as well as his pardon for the sins committed against the world in which we live. So I welcome us to live in this season of creation, to behold the beauty and the splendor of God while working in this world to make it a better place. After my prayer this morning, um, Barbara will be playing God of earth, sky, and sea. Let's pray. 
God of creation. We come to you this season recognizing that you are the creator. And we open our eyes to the beauty that fills the creatures, the land, the air, and the water. You are creator, not only of humankind, but of all that graces this planet and this universe. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.